Hello guys, this is episode 5 of season 4 of Italian Politician of the Week. I am Ipernik, the Great is Silent, and today we are talking about Licio Jelly. It is not particularly easy to find words to describe what kind of person Jelly was. He was a man comfortable in the shadows, who yet sought to control a whole nation. He was a man of connections, connections which will prove helpful, and a man of mystery. To this day, people are uncertain of the gravity of his actions and the impact he left on this nation. Italy during the 70s was the theater of many terrorist attacks and political crises that have led to the death of hundreds of people all across the country. It is widely believed that in order to combat the rise in popularity of left-wing initiatives at the time, many powerful individuals band together to create social tension by causing national tragedies and then blaming it on the radical left specifically their radical groups. Most of the victims' lives were taken away by neo-fascist terrorist groups hated by the Italian army, the police force, the secret service, and to some extent, political institutions themselves. Tragedies like the one in Fontana Square in 1968 and the Bologna station explosion of 1980 were initially blamed on anarchist and radical communist groups, who in retaliation committed more crimes, such as the kidnapping of Aldo Moro in 1978 and the attempted murder of journalist Indra Montanelli in 1977. Jelly was the leader of a secret organization called Propaganda 2, a Masonic lodge that had hundreds of confirmed members, but according to certain estimates there might have been thousands more waiting to be uncovered in Italy and in South America. Before the cease of their operation in 1981, the list included the names of 44 parliamentarians, two ministers of the then government, the party secretary of the Social Democrats Pietro Longo, 12 generals of the Carabinieri, 5 generals of the Guardia di Finanza, 22 generals of the Italian army, 4 of the military air force, 8 admirals, various magistrates and public officials, directors and many officials of the various secret services. The list went further, it also contained the names of university professors, various journalists and entrepreneurs, among them Silvio Berlusconi. Don't worry though, he was a small businessman at the time and most likely had very little involvement in the club. In fact, the list only gives names, not ranks, and it is very likely that many of the people listed can't be credited for the tragic times. In fact, many of them might have signed up for protection, but their presence remains unsettling. The Lodge had a ranking system, plans of national domination, multiple powerful members and was led by a man of unknown ambitions. Who was Licio Gelli? Gelli was born in 1919 in Pistoia. He was raised during fascist times and he was quite devoted to the ideology. In 1936 he volunteered to fight the Spanish Civil War on the side of Franco and rose the ranks of the army and the secret service. At this point it shouldn't be surprising that Gelli served Mussolini in the Second World War as a fascist functionary. In July 1942 as inspector of the National Fascist Party he was entrusted by the military information service with the task of transporting to Italy the treasure of King Peter II of Yugoslavia. It was composed of 60 tons of gold bars, two ancient coins, six million dollars and two million pounds in cash. However, when the treasure was returned to Yugoslavia in 1947, 20 tons of ingots were missing. More on them later. After the armistice of 1943, Jelly acted as a double agent for the fascists, the partisan forces and the Allies. After the war, he was enrolled as a secret agent for the American and British intelligence. By the end of his career in the Secret Service in the mid 50s, Jelly had built a vast net of connections, ranging from the richest Western capitalists to the sketchiest sympathizers of Nazism in Argentina. He would later strike a good bond with Juan Perón. In 1956, he became the commercial director of Permaflex, a company that sold mattresses, although many 
consider this as some sort of cover of his real background activities. In 1970, Jelly will become the leader of Propaganda Due, the previous head, Lino Salvini, no relation to the Salvini we know and love today, run the lodge as some sort of gentleman's club of the powerful, as most Freemasonries were and still are today. Jelly changed that. The Masonic Charter was withdrawn in 1976 and it transformed it into a clandestine, anti-communist, anti-Soviet, anti-leftist, pseudo-Masonic and radical right secret organization that actively fueled the tensions and the terror that prevailed over Italy at the time. Jelly enrolled most of the members on the published list and beyond, spreading its influence in every sector of the country, ranging from the military to the entertainment world. One of the men most attributed to the tension strategy and likely one of the closest collaborators of Jelly was Giulio Andreotti, for many years Minister of Defense and later on Prime Minister. It was never proven that he was actually close to Jelly, nor that he knew of his plans, however considering that most high-ranking officials of everything were part of it, it is unlikely that Andreotti didn't at least have some doubts, especially with the attempted coup d'etat by Borghese in 1970. I plan to cover this eventually on its own video so I won't be saying a lot. In short, Jelly and this guy called Junio Valerio Borghese, a fascist general who is actually credited with multiple war crimes in the Second World War, tried to legit kidnap the president of the Republic, Saragat, who was such a simp for America but that's another story, and establish a new fascist regime, similar to the one in Greece at the time. However, both Jelly and Borghese backed down last minute. The reason for it, this is unknown. Some believe that it was Andreotti who called Borghese at dawn and the general got so scared that he flew to Spain and never came back. Another big affiliate of P2 was financier Michele Sindona, who had acquired control of Long Island's Franklin National Bank in 1972. In 1977, following the bankruptcy of its bank, Sindona turned to Jelly to draw up bailout plans for the Italian private bank. The main one of Sindona's group. According to some accounts, Jelly himself brought Andreotti into this, who assigned his most trusted man, Franco Evangelisti, to study the rescue project of the Italian private bank, which was however rejected by Mario Sarcinelli, deputy director general of the Bank of Italy. Seeing that the institutions were not being cooperative, Sindona went to Sicily and staged a kidnapping by the mafia, which at the time had close relations with P2, and accepted to cooperate in exchange for a cut of the deal. As this was happening, Jelly was pressuring Andreotti to help the bank financially, again allegedly. Italian authorities though found all this pretty suspicious and started investigating. One thing led to another and the bombing of Bologna's central station was one of them, where 80 people died, and the police got the authorization to search Jelly's house, Villa Vanda. There they found a list of about 900 members and the missing gold from the Yugoslav treasure. Sindona will cooperate to a wide extent in exposing Jelly's crimes in order to reduce his sentence until 1986 when he drank poisoned coffee and died in prison. The reason why Jelly had recruited so many journalists, actors and businessmen that worked in the field of entertainment was because he acknowledged the power of the media and he sought to undermine the influence of state television to affect the opinions and the views of the people who would be more willing to accept an authoritarian regime. When Berlusconi got elected, after using his platforms for his campaigns, he commented saying, man, he could have at least given me some credit for the plan. Gerardo Colombo, the magistrate who dealt with the P2 trials and later companion of Di Pietro in Bridesville, will later say if the case hadn't been moved from Milan to Rome in the 80s, the First Republic would have fallen a lot earlier because Jelly was, uh, and I'm not quoting him, this is my interpretation, was like the Greece keeping the whole country together. After several years evading capture in Switzerland, where he bribed guards and bankers, he was eventually arrested and sent back to Italy in the mid-80s. Justice was easy on him, Jelly was sentenced to be home jailed for life, so about 40 years. Until his death in 2015, he would occasionally be interviewed either in the 
the papers or on TV, where he would comment on contemporary politics. His words are often treated as factual truth for some reason. Whenever something happened, he would claim it to be part of his master plan, like the abolition of Article 18 and the Second Republic in general, and people bought it, like if there was a propaganda tree somewhere trying to make us a fascist dictatorship again. I remember the Five Star Movement blogs during Renzi's cabinet were always calling him out for some conspiracy involving Jelly somehow, it, it was painful to remember. Jelly after the 90s was a poor old man stuck in his house and whatever he said, he said it to fuck around with us and to remain relevant. I kind of want to say that he deserves it, but we all know he deserves much more for his crimes. I think that's all I got guys, thank you all so much for watching, I will see you next week with a brand new video.